Greetings, this is Jeff Riddle, pastor of Christ Reformed Baptist Church in Louisa, Virginia. And this is another in this series of readings from and notes and commentary upon Augustine of Hippo's Harmony of the Evangelists. In this episode, we're going to be looking at Book 1, chapters 12 through 14. Chapter 12 has the heading of the fact that the God of the Jews, after the subjugation of that people, was still not accepted by the Romans because his commandment was that he alone should be worshipped and images destroyed. And here is chapter 12. Furthermore, that Hebrew nation, which, as I have said, was commissioned to prophesy of Christ, had no other God but one God, the true God who made heaven and earth, and all that therein is. Under his displeasure, they were oft times given under the power of their enemies. And now, indeed, on account of their most heinous sin in putting Christ to death, they have been thoroughly rooted out of Jerusalem itself, which was the capital of their kingdom, and have been made subject to the Roman Empire. Now the Romans were in the habit of propitiating the deities of those nations whom they conquered by worshipping these themselves, and they were accustomed to undertake the charge of their sacred rites. But they declined to act on that principle with regard to the God of the Hebrew nation, either when they made their attack or when they reduced the people. I believe that they perceived that if they admitted the worship of this deity, whose commandment was that he only should be worshipped, and that images should be destroyed, they would have to put away from them all those objects to which formerly they had undertaken to do religious service, and by the worship of which they believed their empire had grown. But in this, the falseness of their demons mightily deceived them. For surely they ought to have apprehended the fact that it is only by the hidden will of the true God, in whose hand resides the supreme power in all things, that the kingdom was given them, and has been made to increase, and that their position was not due to the favor of those deities who, if they could have wielded any influence whatever in the matter, would rather have protected their own people from being overmastered by the Romans, or would have brought the Romans themselves into complete subjection to them. Certainly they cannot possibly affirm that the kind of piety and manners exemplified by them became objects of love and choice on the part of the gods of the nations which they conquered. They will never make such an assertion if they only recall their, only, their own early beginnings, the asylum for abandoned criminals and the fratricide of Romulus. For when Romulus and Remus established their asylum, with the intention that whoever took refuge there, be the criminal what it might be, with which he stood charged, should enjoy impunity in his deed. They did not promulgate any precepts of penitence for bringing the minds of such wretched men back to a right condition. By this bribe of impunity, did they not rather arm the gathered band of fearful fugitives against the states to which they properly belonged and the law of which they dreaded? Or when Romulus slew his brother, who had per perpetrated no evil against him, is it the case that his mind was bent on the vindication of justice and not on the acquisition of absolute power? And is it true that the deities did take their delight in manners like these, as if they were themselves enemies to their own state, insofar as they favored those who were the enemies of their communities? Nay, ra rather, neither did they by deserting them harm the one class, nor did they by passing over to their side in any sense help the other. For they have it not in their power to give kingship or to remove it. But that is done by the one true God according to his hidden counsel. And it is not his mind to make those necessarily blessed to whom he may have given an earthly kingdom, or to make those necessarily unhappy whom he has deprived of that position. But he makes men blessed or wretched for other reasons, and by other means, and either by permission or by actual gift, distributes temporal and earthly kingdoms to whomsoever he pleases, and for whatsoever period he chooses, according to the foreordained order of the ages. Chapter 13, which is titled, of the question why God suffered the Jews to be reduced to subjection.
Chapter 13 begins, Hence also they cannot meet us fairly with this question. Why then did the God of the Hebrews, whom you declare to be the supreme and true God, not only not subdue the Romans under their power, but even fail to secure those Hebrews themselves against subjugation by the Romans? For there were open sins of theirs that went before them, and on account of which the prophets so long time ago predicted that this very thing would overtake them. And above all, the reason lay in the fact that in their impious fury they put Christ to death, in the commission of which sin they were made blind to the guilt of their crime, through the deserts of other hidden transgressions. That his sufferings also would be for the benefit of the Gentiles was foretold by the same prophetic testimony. Nor, in another point of view, did the fact appear clearer that the kingdom of that nation and its temple and its priesthood and its sacrificial system and that mystical unction, which is called chrisma in Greek, from which the name Christ takes its evident application, and on account of which that nation was accustomed to speak of its kings as anointed ones, were ordained with the express object of prefiguring Christ, then has the kindred fact become apparent that, after the resurrection of Christ, who was put to death, began to be preached unto the believing Gentiles, all those things came to their end, all unrecognized as the circumstance was, whether by the Romans, through whose victory, or by the Jews, through whose subjugation, it was brought about that they did thus reach their conclusion. Chapter 14 has the title of the fact that the God of the Hebrews, although the people were conquered, proved himself to be unconquered by overthrowing the idols and by turning all the Gentiles to his own service. Here indeed we have a wonderful fact, which is not remarked by those few pagans who have remained such, Namely, that this God of the Hebrews, who was offended by the conquered and who was also denied acceptance by the conquerors, is now preached and worshipped among all nations. This is that God of Israel, of whom the prophet spake so long time since, when he thus addressed the people of God, And he who brought thee out, the God of Israel, shall be called the God of the whole earth. What was thus prophesied has been brought to pass through the name of the Christ, who comes to men in the form of a descendant of that very Israel, who was the grandson of Abraham, with whom the race of the Hebrews began. For it was to this Israel also that it was said, In thy seed shall all the tribes of the earth be blessed. Thus it is shown that the God of Israel, the true God who made heaven and earth, and who administers human affairs justly and mercifully in such wise that neither does justice exclude mercy with him, nor does mercy hinder justice, was not overcome himself when his Hebrew people suffered their overthrow in virtue of his permitting the kingdom and priesthood of that nation to be seized and subverted by the Romans. For now indeed by the might of this gospel of Christ, the true king and priest, the advent of which was prefigured by that kingdom and priesthood, the God of Israel himself is everywhere destroying the idols of the nations. And in truth, it was to prevent that destruction that the Romans refused to admit the sacred rights of this God in the way that they admitted those of the gods of the other nations whom they conquered. Thus did he remove both kingdom and priesthood from the prophetic nation, because he who was promised to men through the agency of that people had already come. And by Christ the King, he has brought into subjection to his own name that Roman Empire by which the said nation was overcome, and by the strength and devotion of Christian faith he has converted it so as to effect a subversion of these idols, the honor ascribed to which precluded his worship from obtaining entrance. I am of opinion that it was not by means of magical arts that Christ, previous to his birth among men, brought it about that those things which were destined to come to pass in the course of his history were pre-announced by so many prophets and prefigured also by the kingdom and priesthood established in a certain nation. For the people who are connected with that now established, now abolished kingdom and who in the wonderful providence of God are scattered throughout all lands have indeed remained without any unction from the true king and priest in which anointing the import of the name of Christ is plainly discovered. 
But notwithstanding this, they still retain remnants of some of their observances, while on the other hand, not even in their state of overthrow and subjugation, have they accepted those Roman rites which are connected with the worship of idols. Thus they still keep the prophetic books as the witness of Christ, and in this way, in the documents of his enemies, we find proof presented of the truth of this Christ, who is the subject of prophecy. What then do these unhappy men disclose themselves to be by the unworthy model in which they laud the name of Christ? If anything relating to the practice of magic has been written under his name, while the doctrine of Christ is so vehemently antagonistic to such arts, these men ought rather in the light of this fact to gather some idea of the greatness of that name, by the addition of which even persons who lived in opposition to his precepts endeavored to dignify their nefarious practices. For just as, in the course of the diverse errors of men, many persons have set up their varied heresies against the truth under the cover of his name, so the very enemies of Christ think that, for the purpose of gaining acceptance for opinions which they propound in opposition to the doctrine of Christ, they have no weight of authority at their service unless they have the name of Christ. And this brings Book 1, Chapters 12 through 14 to an end. And we'll move on to a few brief notes and commentary on what we just read. We'll start with uh, Book 1 and Chapter 12 of the fact that the God of the Hebrews, after the subject, subjugation of that people, was still not accepted by the Romans because his commandment was that he alone should be worshipped and images destroyed. Augustine here declares that the Jews were defeated by the Romans and they were expelled from Jerusalem. And he says this was because of the most heinous sin of putting Christ to death. He adds that the Romans did not, however, embrace the God of the Hebrews because that God demanded that he alone be worshipped and there be no images of him. He further notes that the Romans could not claim any moral superiority because their own piety and manners uh, did not uh, were not upright. And even if you look at their history, uh, he says that in the beginnings, Rome was originally an asylum for criminals. He points to the fratricide of Romulus striking down his brother, uh, Remus. And so uh, the suggestion here is that God was not rewarding uh, the Romans for their victory over the Jews because of their moral uprightness, but he was punishing uh, uh, Israel for putting uh, Christ to death on the cross. Uh, he closes by stressing the sovereignty of God, uh, a God who acts as he pleases according to the foreordained order of the ages. Uh, chapter, uh, book one, chapter 13 is titled of the question why God suffered the Jews to be reduced to subject, uh, subjugation. And um, here uh, he's asking the question, why did God permit the Jews to be defeated by the Romans? For Augustine, again, the answer is quite simple. It came about because uh, in their impious fury, as he puts it, they put Christ to death. And in Book 1, Chapter 14, titled, Of the Fact that the God of the Hebrews, although the people were conquered, proved himself to be unconquered by overthrowing their idols and by turning all the Gentiles to his own service. Augustine points out the fact that Christ is now being preached and worshipped across the Roman Empire. Uh, this uh, shows the, the God's favor upon the Christian movement. And it fulfills the promise that was made to Abraham back in Genesis 12 that all nations would be blessed through him. Uh, he, uh, he also notes that this God took away kingdom and priesthood from the Jews because Christ, as he puts it, is the true king and the true priest. Uh, this was announced uh, long ago by the prophets without the use of magical arts. Uh, Christ could not then have written books promoting magical art, arts because his doctrine, Christ's doctrine, uh, is so uh, antagonistic toward and so vehemently opposed to the whole concept of magic. 
Well, this brings uh, this episode to a conclusion. Hope this has been uh, helpful and edifying to those who are listening as we continue to make our way uh, through uh, this work by Augustine, The Harmony of the Evangelists. I look forward to speaking to you in the next episode. Till then, take care and God bless.